Hello, listeners, and welcome to episode 68 of Push to Plat. How are you today? Look, it's a wonderful time to be gaming, whether it be on the Xbox, whether it be on the PlayStation. Obviously, some massive titles in the last week with the Ghost of Tsunami dropping. Tsunami? Mm, we'll go with that. Uh, dropping, of course, a big week for Microsoft, too, with the, uh, the showcase. But look, today I'm very lucky to be joined by a gamer that has a foot in both camps, I believe. We'll find out more about that today. It is the wonderful Aries Flower Girl or X 1001 X Puppies on the Xbox. Now this, uh, I've been reading a lot about her in the last day or two and I can assure you we are nothing alike, listeners, nothing alike at all as gamers, which will make this conversation even more interesting, I think, as we go along. She's she's not a spam hunter, although she is. it seems like in recent times she has turned her hand to that more and more. She's a competitor, she She's a completionist. She, look, she's even left-handed. So what more could you want in a gamer, I think? It's my pleasure to introduce Aries today. How are you? Hey, hello. Uh, thanks for having me. Not at all. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. So why don't we why don't we just start at the beginning, if we could? Would you like to share with our listeners just a little bit of your, your gaming history? Yeah, sure. Um, so back in about 1996, my mom brought down her original Nintendo for me and my twin brother to play. And pretty much that's how it started with just uh, Zelda and Mario. And we kind of grew up on Nintendo with all their systems all the way until about 2003. Um, I went over my best friend's house and she had Halo. So I was playing Halo online with her uh, Xbox Connect. And that's pretty much how my Xbox uh, career started. Um, I just had to have one. I kept begging my parents to go over to her house. And eventually they bought me one. So, um, yeah, so that's when I kind of got Halo 2 and played it for over two and a half years. I was pretty good at it. But um, once the <laughs> Xbox 360 came out, um, I went ahead and got one of those. And there was a game on it that came with it called Hexic. And I kind of fell in love with the game. I was just kind of playing it every day until I got all the achievements. And that's kind of where my achievement addiction started. Um, like my first two completions were Gears of War and Hexic, two very tough games. So pretty much ever since then, just if I play a game, I try to get all the achievements in them. And of course, now, um, both having Xbox and PlayStation, I try to get all the games in the PlayStation games I play. Yeah, I definitely get that from reading about you. You don't do anything by half measures. You're definitely you're definitely all in. Now, one of the things I noticed as well uh, when I was doing some research is you, you write this wonderful blog as well. And you sort of, I mean, you've been around gaming, you know, and, and achievements and, and trophies for some time. I mean, the, your blog starts in 2014 there. And it, it it's, a, it's a lovely documentation of what you were thinking. In fact, I, there's, there's a wonderful quote when you started back again, I think in in 2019 and it was something to the effect of you had to go back and read and sort of cringe at your 22 year old self which I think is lovely yeah <laughs> but but what I what I got from reading that blog in all seriousness is that you're very focused you're, you're a very serious hunter and I mean you, you started off very heavily in multiplayer games I uh, didn't you as you sort of alluded to I wonder if I could ask you about this. You, you, you put in the blog there that you used to play at, at one point there. Now, I ask you this only because a lot of our listeners can understand. So so you're, you're definitely not in the minority here. But uh, you, you played Call of Duty uh, for, for 12 hours a day at one point. And it sort of seems like, like you almost became overwhelming for you. Do you remember that time? And um, Yeah. So back when the game came out, like I played the beta and loved it. Um, so of course I got it day one and I kind of played it a lot and got really good at it. Like my KD was about a 4.9 mm. by the end of it. So, um, once I saw myself gaining on the kill leaderboard, cause I played nothing but domination. I would just go around and kill, you know, the person that everyone hates that doesn't play objective. <laughs> but once I saw I was getting really high on that leaderboard, I kind of just like, started upping my playtime to try to get to like say 25th mm. and yeah it was pretty bad like I was ignoring my family and getting really mad when they asked me to do something and of course I wasn't working then so I didn't have a job but um I would come home from high school and just play Call of Duty till like midnight 
and then rinse and repeat. And it got pretty frustrating, <laughs> as you can probably imagine, trying to like catch back up after getting home from school. Yeah. And then like, so eventually I got to 25th and like I took a really crappy screenshot with my phone. And after that, I just kind of, my multiplayer kind of died down. I definitely didn't want to play anything as hardcore as that one. Mm. So yeah, I kind of, I kept, I kept playing Call of Duty until about Black Ops 2, I think. But the older I got, the more annoying it was <laughs> trying to play competitively. So I just kind of stopped one day. Yeah, no, I, I can understand. It's an interesting thing because, uh, like, I, I've spoken to Hakum. I've spoken to many of the Mr. Unknown. I've spoken to many of the top-level trophy hunters uh, before and, and some on the Xbox side as well. And a lot of them were gamers, you know, sort of, I suppose, achievement gamers and trophy gamers before achievements and trophies even existed in that they, they played games through to completion regardless of getting this digital bling or whatever else. And it, it sounds very much the same for you in your multiplayer games. So what what changed in your mind from, from you know, putting lots of hours into a, to a multiplayer game where you, I suppose ultimately you're playing for fun but you know to improve your ranking and things what what made the mental shift for you from going from that to then playing lots of games for trophies and achievements so sort of expanding your gaming I suppose yeah it was definitely the fun factor like um at a certain point like it was just really frustrating trying to play multiplayer and not be as good as I was at four and um, that's kind of when I started shifting away from them. Like I would still play, I would still get the yearly Call of Duty, but I certainly wouldn't put 12 hours a day into it. Mm. Um, eventually I just found it more fun to pick up games like say, I don't know, like Bioshock or Dragon Age and play them all the way through. And you know, uh, the achievements were kind of like a way to say, okay, if I do all of these achievements, I've kind of beaten the game completely. So that's kind of how I shifted away from multiplayer. Now it it hasn't all been you know all been wonderful I imagine I mean there there are a lot of lot of crazy games that you know go into gamer score and trophies to build the level of course uh, one of the games that I read that you you enjoyed immensely was of course FIFA 06 which I wasn't <laughs> yeah. familiar with this game but apparently an easy completion on the Xbox that isn't an easy completion is that correct No it definitely kicked my ass um I'm not a very much of a sports person so I obviously didn't really know how to play soccer and mm. i just read that it was a quick completion because i was in a uh i was in a tournament for achievements at the time mm. and man it was just it was just whooping my ass i just had to i had i almost like got rid of it i had like packed it up to sell it and then i was like okay you know what i cannot leave this easy game on my profile with like three <laughs> out of five achievements that's terrible so i think i gave it another go and this time I got it, but man, that was that was definitely one of the rougher ones in my career. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. I want to. Why don't we we touch on that? What what type of hunter you are? I mean, you currently have on PlayStation here a hundred percent profile. I see it at level forty one. So it's obviously fair to to call yourself a completionist. But I mean, you're almost the next step of completionist because I also I also was linked to a a database, if you like, or a spreadsheet where you're actually tracked your completion uh, percentage by day and things like this. So so it's very it, it's almost like the meta game within the game for you, isn't it? Yeah, I remember doing that spreadsheet. It was kind of like a fun thing to see, like, okay, when was my PlayStation profile, like, at its lowest or at its worst? And there was definitely a mm. period of time where I was not fond of buying DLC until it went on, like, a super sale. So, like, mm. something like, let's say, Call of Duty, when it comes out with its four or five zombie maps, I was just letting them sit there and not do them. So it was dragging my completion down. And then one day in uh, 2018... I actually got the trophy that was holding me back. It was in a NASCAR game, and I kind of like those games, but um, it was a really hard trophy, and it was even more harder for me because I didn't have a racing wheel. Yes. So once I finally got it, I was like, okay, that was the last one holding me back. I can go for 100% if I buy all these DLCs. So that's kind of what I did um, in 2018. I just took every game that I had outstanding DLC for and just went ahead and bought them. It was like a hundred dollars or something kind of hurt but then then i spent the whole summer doing like call of duty zombies um i think there was prey moon crash dlc the division kind of let that sit there for a long time and yeah on july 18th 2018 i finally hit 100 percent, and i've kept it ever since 
Yes, congratulations. It's a, it's, a, it's a fantastic achievement. It's something that I can only dream of, listeners. You know, <laughs> it, it affects me greatly, obviously, at night. Keeps me up all night. But that's wonderful. What I have to ask then, obviously, you know, coming from the other side of it, looking at your profile, is you, you do play a wide range of games. Because you've hit the 100%, and I'm sure that's important to maintain, are there games that you'll avoid playing now because you're worried on the PlayStation side about not being able to finish them? Yeah, it's definitely always a worry, especially for new games, because you don't know if they're going to like have glitch trophies and whatnot. So that's always scary. Um, I try not to play brand new games that I don't really want to play, because I know mm. they're going to have DLC. I'd rather just buy like a complete edition. For example, um, Spider-Man. I still haven't got around to that. But uh, now that they've got a Game of the Year edition with all DLC, definitely going to check it out soon. But mm. um, yeah, I try to stay away from hard games. Um, the main reason not to keep my tag at 100%, but is I just don't have the patience I used to have for hard games. So, like, there's, like, an mm. ultra-rare trophy. It's more than likely going to require, like, some patience that I just don't have anymore. <laughs> so, yeah, long, long gone are the days of, like, sitting down for an hour trying to figure out a Dark Souls boss. <laughs> I'd rather just plow through it and enjoy the story with some yeah. fun gameplay. It's one of the great things about getting older, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Your, 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 your tolerance, I suppose. Well, your time tolerance is different. You have many other things uh, pressing on you as well. Now, I understand. Yeah. So, so, look, I'd like to ask you, I, I'm pretty sure I, I know the, the, the essence of your name here is a, a Final Fantasy VII sort of a reference, but but I'll still ask anyway, you know, for the listeners. How, how did you come up with the Aries Flower Girl for, for PSN and, and why did you choose it, I suppose? Yeah, so um, it's definitely from Final Fantasy VII. Um, that's one of my favorite games of all time. And I just, ever since I played it for the first time, I really liked Aerith. Of course, her name is mostly Aerith in the uh, U.S., but mm. the original Final Fantasy VII has her name as Aerith. And yeah, eventually, like, um, I just kind of got tired of my old gamer tag because it, spell it technically spells puppies wrong, but there's a story to that we can get to in a little bit. But um, anyways, <laughs> once PSN finally allowed you to change your PSN. I changed it to Aerith, Flower Girl. Um, I would have taken Aerith mm. with the TH, but it wasn't available. So I just stuck with Aerith. And then I changed pretty much all my online stuff to uh, same thing, like Discord and Twitch and all that. And then, look, I'm going to have to ask on the on the Xbox side as well. So it's 1,000 X puppies. Is that correct? What's the, the story behind that? <laughs> yeah, so um, back in 2003, when I was playing Halo 1, the, you could make your, your name, but it was only 11 letters. So I wanted to do 101 Dalmatians. That was like my favorite movie back then, but it wouldn't fit. There was not enough letter space on Halo 1. So I changed it to, you know, 13-year-old me, changed it to 1001 Puppies, which would only fit if you did P-U-P-B-Y-S. Uh, mm -hmm. So ever since then, I just kind of kept that tag. That's been like my Halo and uh, Xbox tag. I still have it as X1000X puppies because it's so old. So I don't plan mm. on changing that. Yeah, so now I have completely different PSN and Xbox tags. <laughs> oh, I like that. I think I think there's a there, there's something to be said for keeping the two two profiles separate. But look, I'm I must ask. It so it, it sounds like you you were very heavily into Xbox, and then uh, I think maybe towards the end of 2014 2015, you moved across to the PlayStation. If I'm correct, now I'm not sure whether this was because of the well, I'm not exactly sure why. Perhaps you'd like to like to let us know why, why did you why did you come to the dark side. Uh, sure. So there was probably two, three main reasons. Uh, first, obviously, PS4 um, crossed off Xbox with a $100 difference in price. And back then, mm. I was working in like retail, so it wasn't like I had a ton of money to throw around. So $100 was a big difference. Number two, most of my real-life friends were moving over to PlayStation, probably for the same reasons as me, like cost, and which brings me to my third point, um, the exclusives, they just look better. Halo kind of had, or uh, not Halo, um, Xbox kind of had Halo and Killer Instinct and neither of those, I mean, I love Halo, but like having to reap, like their only main game being like a rehash of the first four Halos was kind of off-putting when PlayStation had things coming out like uh, Bloodborne and Horizon and all that. So that was my main reason for the Switch. Um, I wouldn't say I regret it, but it is kind of annoying having two tags 
because like if all my trophies are on my uh, Xbox profile, I'd have nearly 700,000 gamer score by now and vice versa. <laughs> <laughs> you've you've opened the door there because obviously you know it, we only have so much time so balancing you know two and i mean they're two two sizable profiles on both systems we won't sell yourself short there how do you decide now what to play are you are you like especially for a lot of these games now in the current generation where they're on both systems so how do you ch- choose whether you play for achievements or trophies or do you do both right now i mainly play um non-exclusives on playstation um, they're a little bit more reliable as far as, so Xbox One, you have to be like online to earn achievements and that can be really annoying if you don't have a connection or Xbox Live is down. So I mainly play on PS4, um, but I do do, um, I'm a staff member on xboxachievements.com and I help run tournaments. So when there's a tournament, I will jump on Xbox and play some games. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Perfect. I like that. So look, why don't we, well, first off, look, I have to ask, cause it's rare that we get someone that actually plays the Xbox on this show. Look, I love to, you know, talk about how I turn it on occasionally, Eris, but you know, I very rarely find the time to actually play the thing, but, but it's wonderful to have someone on that actually does play it. So I have to ask your opinion. I'm sure you probably watched the showcase uh, the other day. What are you, what are you feeling about Xbox moving into the next generation? Um, my feelings are pretty similar to the one. There's not really a whole lot coming out that's going to make me want to buy one day one. Um, obviously, Halo is a big thing. It's been a big part of my life, a massive part of my life. But, you know, I don't really want to run out and buy a Series X just to play Halo. You know, there's going to have to be a couple of games that follow it. Fable looks pretty fun, but I'm not sure if I'm going to... Like I said, that's not really enough to justify going out and buying a system. Especially, I don't think we know the price points yet, so... No, no, I can, I can understand. It's it's a very funny time. I think both the consoles uh, seem to be seem to be sort of hedging their bets against each other. No one, no one's prepared to say what what the cost is till the other one does. So we'll we'll, we'll have to wait and see. So yeah. look, you've opened the door on competitions here as well. Now we're going to get into this a little bit in the in the topic. But I, you, you did mention you're a staff member on on True Achievements. Now we recently had a, a wonderful guest on the, the wonderful Eigen Space who organizes some some events on uh, PSN profiles for for the PlayStation community what what is it about competition play that you enjoy on consoles yeah so i'm actually a staff member on xbox achievements not true achievements. Oh, sorry xbox yeah but um i don't know i like that i like that trash talk you know i like i said i grew up on a ton of halo and i was really good at it so you know mm. it's just like if someone would challenge me to a 1v1 i'd be like okay you know i'm gonna easily win this so ever since then like i've just been really competitive in nature and the achievement tournaments are really fun for me because i'm pretty good at unlocking achievements fast i know where to go for shortcuts i can take so it's been really fun uh the current tournament i'm kind of i kind of ran out of time in the current tournament because the last of us it took too long to get here and i just i wanted to play it so (laughs) i'm getting i'm getting beaten up in the current tournament but uh, i'm still helping run it and verify scores and stuff so it's been fun okay perfect perfect well, we might we might come back to that in the, the sort of topic but why don't we just take a little look there now that we now that we've got to know you here why don't we take a little look at, at what you've been playing now i don't mind if you if you want to focus on the, the playstation side or the xbox i'll leave it up to you do you, do you want to throw out a, a couple of things for our listeners that you've been playing recently uh sure so in the last two months uh the biggest two games i've played are assassin's creed odyssey and uh the last of us 2 both on playstation uh, both were really enjoyable. Odyssey kind of ran on a little long because of all the DLC and added missions. So it could have could have done with a little cut on the content or either that or take a break. But I don't really take breaks and come back to things. I like to beat them all in one sitting. And uh, The Last of Us, that was, that was really, really good. Um, I liked it a lot better than the first one. Uh, I know there's a lot of controversy out there surrounding multiple different things but i mean i really enjoyed it i i don't really look too much into the hate i just kind of play games to enjoy them yeah yeah i can understand that well let's let's just pick up on o- o- odyssey if we can for a second here as you said it is a massive game i mean even origin i mean origins was starting to extend the games the the game before but by the time we got to this one it, it's over 100 i'm not sure how long it took you but but a, a weak skilled gamer like myself it took over 100 hours uh, for me to do all the dlc so it's a sizable it's a sizable chunk of time. Now, was I right in reading that you also had a glitch in this game as well? Yeah, so um, two of the trophies are revolve around killing Cyclops. They were added as DLC, free DLC. 
And unfortunately, mm. they did not spawn for me. I never got the mission. I didn't get the enemy. So I actually had to sit on it for about three weeks until they released a patch. And my only option, if they didn't release a patch, would have to be to like replay the game and hope they show up. And so nobody really knew what caused them to show up for some and not show up for others. So yeah, that was that was kind of annoying. But I mean, one day they finally released the patch. I saw it pop up on my PlayStation, and I went straight there. I was like, "Let me get these trophies." Yes. Oh, that's insane. That would that that sort of thing would just finish me on a game. I wouldn't. I would just delete it. But yeah, that that um, um, it's wonderful that it, it worked out. Now I have to ask: Did you did you enjoy the Fate of Atlantis more, or did you enjoy the Legend of the First Blade more, the expansion? You know, I actually enjoyed the the first Blade more. Mm. Um, I really liked the backstory and the gameplay and the setting. Um, by the time I got to Fate of Atlantis, I'll have to admit, I was getting pretty burned out. So um, that definitely dipped my enjoyment of it. But it was still pretty fun. Um, I liked the first one the best, I think. The first episode with, is it Elysium or something? Mm, mm, mm. And uh, the second one, the underworld, that was pretty dumb. I was like ready to get out of that place. Yeah. <laughs> <And then laughs> yes. The third one, the third one was pretty good too. So I think my enjoyment was only dipped because it was getting like long. Yeah. But other than that, it was still it was still enjoyable. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I like that. And then uh, you've just recently, as you said, you've just recently platted the Last of Us uh, Part Two. I mean, you know, as you said, whatever controversy, it doesn't matter because I enjoyed it too. And if we both enjoyed it, that's really all that matters, you know, because we're the ones talking. But you know, it, it's it's a wonderful game, a wonderful narrative game, or whatever. One of the things I loved about this game, and because you're you know a trophy huntress as well, I'd like to ask you about this, is that you know a lot of the AAA games like Assassins, they have a huge amount of collectibles. They're everywhere, you know, and, and sometimes they track them, sometimes they don't, sometimes it's successful, sometimes it's not. One of the things I loved about The Last of Us 2, now I'm not sure, I'm sure you have an opinion on this, so I'm not sure if we had on the same page though. One of the things I loved was the way that you could use a clear save to go back and clean up the, the collectibles in such a such an easy manner and with all the checkpointing as well. It, it became it became for me very, very easy in, in what is, you know, like still a reasonably large game at 25 to 30 hours. How did you find all that side of it? Did you find it that way, streamlined, or not so much? Yeah, funny you bring that up. Um, a lot of people who know me know that I really hate collectibles. <laughs> <laughs> and when I opened up the uh, the collectible guide and saw 286, I was like, yes. good <laughs> God. But um, I didn't mind the... Uh, so I went for all the collectibles on my first playthrough, just so I didn't have to worry about them when I was cleaning up miscellaneous stuff. And I didn't mind all the notes. They were really fun to read. Things like, you know, what people were going through either during the pandemic or on outbreak day. I really enjoyed that. But the random useless collectibles like trading cards and coins, I was like, come on, really? You know, why am I picking these up? And uh, so in the end, you know, I got through it. I was so ready to be done. Yeah, no, no, I can, I can understand that. It's funny. I did a, we did a deep dive a, a couple of weeks ago on the game, and we didn't uh, because the the person I did it with, they're not a, a trophy hunter at all. They they just play games for the enjoyment of it, listeners. You know, which as we know, it's shocking. Why would you do that? But they do. You know, it, it happens. <laughs> not for our series, but it does happen for some people. Uh, so you know, and and we never talked about really the collectibles because they weren't a major part of his game. You know, he didn't worry about the two hundred or whatever. But it, it is an interesting thing, and it, it's a wonderful thing they put in along with the accessibility as well now i just want to dig back a little bit further a little bit selfishly i do this areas i don't know if you're if you're familiar with this or not but you'll just have to tolerate it i apologize yeah no you worries. have a game here that i i played oh a long time ago it feels like but then i, I dropped off it the talus principles a, a puzzler of sorts i think it's a very unique style game how did you find this game oh man yeah so um actually that brings up another story hmm. um when I played Final Fantasy VII Remake earlier this year, um, the game was so good that it actually put me for the first time in a gaming slump where I didn't want to actually play anything. I just kind of wanted to laze about on Netflix. And it wasn't until about a month and a half later when I played the Talos Principle that it broke me out of that slump because I loved it so much. Um, I'm a big fan of Crow Team. I grew up on the series Sam series. Uh, that was one game that my best friend and I played a lot together. So I actually played uh, Talos Principle just based on the developer, mm -hmm. and I ended up loving it. I tried to do everything without looking it up. 
And then when like I finally threw in the towel, I would watch a uh, video and I'd be like, holy shit, <laughs> like I would have never figured this out. So um, that game was great. I loved it. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic game. And look, the only other one I, I want to ask you about here, only because I started this recently and I, I don't have nostalgia for the series, which I think is a bit of a problem. I think I need to work into it to understand it better because I know it's it's very beloved, is, of course, the Saints Row, the third remaster. Now, everyone tells me it is a wonderful remaster and, and from what I've played, as I said, I'm not familiar with the series. It, it seems good. Did you did you enjoy it? Is it is it a good remaster version? Um, so yeah, another funny story about this game. <laughs> I'm glad you're picking all the great games. Um, I have, enjoyed it the first time from. I played it. Yeah, mm. I've, I played it on 360 and I enjoyed the heck out of it. And then I was like begging a friend to get it so we could play it on the PS4 together. And mm. man, it was just full of glitches. Like him and I ran into so many glitches and mm. like the gameplay was just very outdated compared to like Saints Row 4 and other crazy co-op games we had played together. So um, overall, I actually did not enjoy the remaster, and I kind of had to apologize to my friend. I was like, this was not that bad seven years ago or whenever it was. But uh, yeah, we ran into a lot of glitches. Maybe they're fixed now, but mm. when the game first came out, it was just like dozens of them. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's 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 funny you mentioned that I'm picking all the good games. The more I look at your your PlayStation profile, the more I mean I come down here and yeah, sure I see the Music Racer and I, you know I see a few things here that uh, suspect. But you know, <clears throat> Fifty Words by Palky Perhaps. But you know there is a lot of <laughs> there is a lot of quality here as well. And one of the things that I like is you know we made a little reference when we we're talking beforehand. But you you have a few visual novels on your your profile, but you you do you do seem to read them as well by the time limits there. Sorry, I, I stole listeners because, you know, maybe sometimes I don't read them. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> but look, I, I'm sure perhaps the same is for you. Do you like the visual novel genre? I mean, it, 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 I know it's very beloved in the trophy and achievement hunting circles, but not always for the content. I really fell in love with Steins Gate. That's definitely like top tier visual novel. Um, the Steins Gate series is definitely my favorite. And then obviously they came out with one around December and I really enjoyed that. Holy cow. But uh, the visual novels as a whole, I actually sometimes get kind of bored with them because I like, I like fall asleep trying to read them sometimes. Mm. I'm more of a, you know, have to be doing something or I'll fall asleep kind of person because I don't sleep much. But um, yeah, the, the most recent ones I've played, I kind of got like part, part way through most of them and then got bored. So you might see a couple of days in length, but I kind of skipped through some parts. Of course, there was these, uh, the what were those games called? I have them on my shelf. I can't see. Code Realize. Those were pretty good. Um, I played through two out of three of them. Uh, one of them I kind of skipped. But uh, mm. those were those were pretty enjoyable. Of course, those are a domain novels, so like guys may not find them as good as girls would. But, but yeah, as a whole... Like I, I, sometimes I get bored, but sometimes like I'll pick up, it's kind of like picking up a good book, you know, you read through it and you're like, wow, that's pretty good. And obviously, obviously the trophies are easy because if you miss something, you can just speed through it, following a guide and pick up everything you missed. So what can I share with you this week? Well, look, I've got a couple of things and seeing we're giving the Xbox a bit of love. What if I, what if I start there? Because I have, I have made a return of sorts to there lately. And look, I knocked off the fragments of him. Now this game is available on PlayStation as well. It's only a hundred percent game, but of course a full, a full 1000 G completion on the Xbox. In fact, I believe it has two stacks on the PlayStation NNA and an EU. So look what it is. It's a narrative, highly narrative driven walking simulator. It's a really touching, if sad story, perhaps more for your mature gamer. I don't know that it would hold much interest for the the shooting crowd perhaps but look it is it is a beautiful title it's all done in black white and and shades of gray a sort of a minimalistic approach and it's just a matter of sort of clicking on different objects and items that are always highlighted and that just furthers the narrative it's very simple there is a chapter select afterwards and uh they're, they're potentially 
actually two missable trophies, but you'll you'll get them within a few minutes if you if you are uh, just use the chapter select after so you can sit and relax. It takes about an hour and a half to two hours maximum, and there's some some wonderful music in there, and it's just I mean it's just a life story I suppose of of of, of a boy growing into a man and his relationships, and then and then and then how it goes from there. I won't say any more uh, to spoil it, but it's it's well worth your your Sunday afternoon time if you if you haven't come across it. I think. The other one that I'll drop out for Xbox, because there's been a little bit of spam, I'll be honest with you, listeners. There's some, some wonderful spam on the Xbox that never seems to have made it to the PlayStation yet. So, so you know, but, you know, that's that's for another time, perhaps. But the other one I'll drop out, and I noticed this came up on the PlayStation Store the other day. Of course, we know that Telltale is no longer with us, but, you know, the Skybound picked up the, the licenses and, and carried forth with a lot of the properties. Now, I believe, well, I'm not sure if they picked up all of them or just The Walking Dead. So I'm not sure if they have this one or someone else, but it, of course, referring to the Telltale Batman series, there were two two seasons of that. And for me, that was one of my favorite ones. I'm not a massive Batman fan or anything, but it really got me in. And one of the things I actually liked about it was how dark, you know, and, and sort of gritty and noir it really was. And then you had these these flashes of color and... Well, what attracted me to this game this time is, and I don't know if you've seen it on the store, probably doesn't interest you if, you, if you've already played it, but is the the Batman Shadows Edition. So what this basically is, it's a black and white version, if you like, a very noir version of the of the both seasons sold as a package. And instead of, I started it last night, and instead of just total black and white, it throws splashes of colour. And you're like, well, you know, I'd rather just play it in colour like it was intended, but... It really works. It's it's sort of going for capturing the comic book essence of the game, I think. And so, so you know, you've got these black and white scars and then you've got like this, you know, blood and it'll just be bright red uh, against the, the black backdrop. Or, you know, you'll have the blue of the police lights or something and, you know, the green of the, the mask, the Joker's mask. And it's really vivid. And I, I'm, I'm looking forward to playing it this way. If you've already platted it or completed it and you own it, there is actually an upgrade if it so interests you, I think for like eight Australian dollars or something where you can get this shadow mode there's no extra trophies or gamer score but you know if you haven't played it it's definitely something to consider now it doesn't look like you can change between those so once you start one or the other that's the way you're gonna you're gonna have to progress but look i i was a little hesitant if there would be enough replayability value in in wanting to play it again with this but i really think i think there will be it was it was a good good story to start with but now seeing it in this different way and yes it's upscaled a little bit and i'll, I'll be interested to see later on i know i believe it was in the the second series in particular there was dropping there was all sorts of garbage uh you know stalls faces not out or something except for some people so i believe that's all been cleaned out as well but just a different way to play now moving across to the the playstation this week and what can i throw at you well i'm going to start with this little max and the book of chaos so this is a jandusoft game and i, I jokingly and lovingly refer to them as the jandusoft jank because in these games they definitely have they appeal to me i suppose they definitely have that quality in them so they of course did the smooth summer games recently the turbo controller fest they did the tv calamity uh game which i really enjoyed as well which was a sort of a top down uh shooter if you like uh, very arcadey in its essence and now they've they've come up with this max and the book of chaos now there is a story here overarching which is you know of limited value i think but it's it's nice that it's there but the premise of the gameplay of the game are shooting galleries basically you you sort of they're 2d if you like uh just single screen shooting galleries and th- look it's it gets progressively harder but one thing i've realized with these games by Gendersoft is that they're not like they they appear to be skill games, but they're not really because with this game there are many pickups. Now it's random what pickups you get, and you know some of the pickups are immunity, some stronger weapons and things. So if you're lucky enough, and particularly on the boss fights, which can be challenging, if you're lucky enough to to get the right pickups at the right time, you will pass it. So so sometimes it becomes very hard to beat the boss, but then you do it you know three or four times, you get the right pickups. It, it's really simple or whatever else. The the other interesting thing is that one of the bosses in particular is kind of challenged, but he has two phases and it seems random which phase comes first or even if both phases come. So you, you can get sort of lucky there, which, which look, I like. I know that would annoy a lot of people. They just want the game to play as it is, but... 
It definitely means if you're having trouble and you persist, you will get through it. I, I'd say this game is around four to five hours. But again, if you're skilled with the game or, or you're stacking it, because it is an EU and NA stack, you could probably do this in, in as short as an hour and a half. Definitely if you have experience with these sort of shooting gallery games. Uh, the only only tip I'd put out or preface is that you can run two sort of builds. You can run a dash build with your, your specials, the stars, unlock these special abilities, listeners. And the dash build will let you dash through the projectiles the enemy fires so this is obviously the highly skilled players approach and i was talking to mick a recent guest from nof's guides the owner of nof's guides and he told me that this was the the method he used and you know promoted in the guide and i think that's probably the, the very valid way to play it but if you're like me and you know you, you you have trouble with these sort of games there is a build which will give you two extra potions which in effect are hearts in this game and that does make you very sort of very powerful it sort of allows you to adopt the god stance i think at times and just break yourself and hope to beat the boss so look it's wonderful whether you'd want to play it twice or not probably depends on your your you know susceptibility to jank but but once i think it's definitely worth it and it's only a few dollars which is always great for this company now we're going to talk a little nascar later on in the episode so only you know briefly there i did jump in on heat five i'm not really sure because i have heat four and heat three in various stages but look it is ultimately the same game but as i said before it does play wonderfully with a wheel but you know if you're interested in the series you might as well just pick up two or three or four if you like because they're they're all the same game rather than rather than the the fifth one and then, I mean, we, we should give some love, I suppose, to the white boys with attitude, the pursuit of uh, happiness. Uh, of course, this one here drops some DLC, some lovely DLC for a buck or something. And look, yes, of course, it plays exactly the same as the perp game where you can just randomly, you know, randomly wank the controller off if you like, and that will will get you the completion. Again, it requires a, a perfect no miss of the notes score to uh, to get the final gold trophy. But look, overall, very easy trophies. It might take you a few goes but there's nothing there's nothing too painful there and of course it does come packed with another single from their album so so for a dollar you're, you're really getting value and you know i notice i notice around the traps listen i don't like to preach you know i don't want to preach to you but i noticed that there was a little bit of disgruntlement perhaps you know that this free game suddenly had a paid dlc a paid dlc you know, you know I'll, I'll, I'll throw hundreds of dollars at Radalika or thousands of dollars at Visual Nobles for the plat, but oh, your dollar? CJ, please, please. But look, that's what it is. So go in forewarned. Also go forewarned that now they've found this, perhaps this won't be the first DLC. We'll see. So if this, is a, if this is an issue for you, and rightly so, you know, plant your flag and stand on the hill, I, I, I will support that, then uh, this may be a game that you want to avoid. But look, if you're not a cheap bastard and you can afford a dollar to get the single, which is probably cheaper than it would cost buying it anywhere else with any other group then you know have a look have a look and earn some trophies while you do so look the last one i'll throw at you and yes i picked up skater xl i haven't got to it yet you're not surprised are you yes i have got destroy your humans haven't had a chance yet maybe today we'll see we'll see i have been spending a lot of time in the ghosts of Tashima, but you know i think that game demands it it just seems to go on forever look it's growing on me I, I will say that I do. I do like the narrative stories of it much more than the the collectathon. There are so many foxes in that game; it is insane. I saw some figure about how many millions of foxes had been patted by PlayStation gamers so far. And look, you're probably going to plat, uh, plat, <laughs> hopefully plat. You're probably going to pat close to a thousand of them in your playthrough because they're just everywhere anyway. Those shrines. So, but that aside, I'm really enjoying the. Uh, well, I don't know what they. I think maybe they're shrines as well. Are they the the sort of where you, you have to do the jumping it's a, it's a very assassin's creed-esque like jumping puzzles if you like uh you know and swinging puzzles to get to that final shrine to pray there and get the the reward i like those things but they're they're a lot you know looser on the ground they're not they're not everywhere so perhaps that is that is why but look i think there's probably a lot of depth into this game if you if you want to put it in the combat but for me i'm i'm basically just smashing the triangle button so it, it has become a hack and slash -a -thon, although I did experiment a little with the, the R2, which can change stances. I hadn't bothered until this point in, in Act 2. But there is some variety here. But look, you know, it's very easy. I mean, you know, like the... It's, I don't know, the parry is, it's very wide. There's plenty of time to do it. There's plenty of time to, to break their attack. It's definitely not Souls-like or anything like that. So it's a very easy, but, you know, enjoyable, enjoyable of sorts game. 
And then the only other one I'll throw out, and we'll probably get into this more perhaps next week because I'm on a bit of a spam kick. I've decided that August I'm just going to clean house of all these sort of trophy games, you know, in preparation for the, the new Xbox, of course, coming later in the year. And I stumbled on the 112th seed. So I may not be telling you anything here, listeners, but if I am, I would, I would suggest this game. It's, it's very easy. It's a very easy puzzler game. In fact, some of the levels are insanely easy and... It has this wonderful trope, though, in this game where it, it takes a level to explain a new mechanic to you, which I really like. So rather than just a whole lot of text, you know, here's the new mechanic, good luck, it sort of teaches you how to use, you know, the, the raindrop or the, the box or whatever else in a level, and then you start to progressively use it. it does have this weird thing within the fir- first 30 levels where it puts some really random easy level for no reason, you know, followed by, you know, I suppose harder, but not too hard levels. There are some fantastic videos video walkthroughs if you do need them and of course you only need to do the first 30 levels for the plat it'll probably take you you know if you if you get stuck or if you need to check a guide it'd probably take you half an hour if not you can probably do it in like 20 minutes or something i'd say there are three stacks at the moment the japanese the na and the eu for a couple of bucks and i'm sure we'll see the hk in the near future so now well, we're going to talk what I think is a pretty big feat to do in one month, and I, I want to I want to hear about it. I want to hear what was involved with it, and I want to hear how you how you managed to drive yourself through that month because I'm sure it wasn't all bliss and roses. So we'll be right back, listeners. Just take a, a quick break. Okay, listeners, so welcome back. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have a look at this. Now, this was brought to my attention by this I'm Starling on Yabro, who's, look, he's been wonderful for our community. I understand he's, he's wonderful for everyone, you know, with his stylings around the place. But he, he linked me an article a month or so ago here from Kotaku, and it was about how an accountant had scored 132 gamer score in one month. Now, I know, listeners, some of you are like, oh, who cares, CJ? It's more rata garbage, you know, that's all you talk about out these days, Augie, sometimes you, whatever else. But look, that's still an impressive number, I think. And I think that takes a lot of mental fortitude. And also, it must take a pretty good reason to do it as well. So, so Aries, I want to get into this. Now, this was part of a, a gamer score league or something like this. Is that is that correct? Yeah. So, um, xboxachievements.com holds a gamer score league every uh, once a year. And it's basically like teams get together and the bit, the whole goal is as a team score more gamer score than your opponents. So that's kind of where that stemmed mm. from. Um, now the plan when the month started was not to do 132,000 gamer score. <laughs> so the competition actually was pretty tough um, for the first three weeks. There was a yes. guy who he said he had like every Xbox one game or like 90% of them like in his library and he was retired so he just could play all day and any game he wanted and mm. i saw the work so uh my teammate and i because it was teams of two uh we really had to work to get around him and by the time we did we were 24 days into the 29 day competition and when we got to that point i was like i still had a ton of easy games like Bradalika and like you said sometimes you and all those games. So mm. I was like, okay, you know, the only goal I have left, like, what if I can beat the Gamer Score League record for most Gamer Score earned during an event? And that's pretty much what I did. It, it's 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 impressive. So, and, and as you say, like, I mean, you know, we, we continually hear about, you know, the, the people at the top of the leaderboards, the people that produce these big scores, you know, uh, you know, for a month or month in, month out or whatever. All it is is just, a, you know, them throwing their money and their time around, you know, and they, they have all the time in the world to play. But it's very different, as you say, where you're working as well. How many, like, hours a day did you have to play in this month, roughly? Um, I didn't really track. Um, it's probably like I would get home. Well, actually, the pandemic kind of sped it up a little bit because about mm. probably about two weeks into the competition, we were actually, you know, told to stay home and work from home. So I didn't have to get up early to like shower and do my makeup and stuff. 
I could just go straight to like I could get up, take a quick quick shower or wash my face or whatever, and then go straight into work. And at 5:30 on the nose, I could clock out, throw my work laptop over in the corner, and get straight to gaming rather than having to commute and wind down and all that. So that did increase my time. But normally, like if I wasn't doing anything with family or friends, I would be trying to earn as much gamer score in quick games as I could per day. Maybe like maybe like five to six on the weekday, and then like ten to twelve on the weekends. Yeah, it's it's still sizable. I noticed from reading your blog as well that you're you're a bit of a night owl as well, which you're lucky. You're still young enough, obviously, to be able to do that which is impressive for me. But uh, so I, I imagine that helps. But what about the, you know, look, I play a lot of these games that I imagine you played as well to get there to the 132K. It, it's not all just about time and being able to afford the game. I mean, actually pushing through this many games in one month, I would imagine takes a bit of a mental toll on you. Did you did you feel that? Or was the adrenaline of the competition enough to push you through? There was definitely a mental toll from playing all the crap the the goal was to kind of find games that were like hidden gems and i did i found a couple of games that i was like oh well that wasn't so bad i like that yeah so um i actually had a list of 10 games that i found that i was like oh that was really good um at the top of that list was a game called air aer mm. it was like a it was like a little indie game where you fly around as a bird and like look at this like i guess you're you're kind of stopping an evil which is you know cliche and whatever but i really enjoyed that game it's about a two-hour completion. In conjuncture with that, I would play uh, fun games like Life, Life is Strange 2. Uh, I completed that during the tournament, which was actually my longest completion, I think 14 hours. And uh, so here's a funny one. I completed Dark Souls Remastered during the tournament. Yes, I saw this. Now, that is not the usual sort of game you would think about as, as a quick plot or a quick uh, completion. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. And the thing was, I've actually played that game so much. It's one of my favorites of all time. So when I went into it, I knew exactly what to do to get the platinum or well, the 1000 gamer score as quickly as possible. And with some help from some uh, Xbox community members who could drop things like weapons for me, I was able to complete it in just under 10 hours. So that was that being one of my favorite games of all time really helped to break up the monotony of the terrible you know, quick 1,000 gamer score games. Yes, yeah. yeah. You, you sort of need that, though, as you say, I think, don't you? Otherwise, you know, it's all, it's all well and good to smash these short things, but you, you just go insane otherwise uh, over over time. Now, look, I we, we had Eigen on recently, and she started a, a female's uh, a, a event, a maiden's event, I believe, on the, on the PlayStation. Now, I'm not as deeply immersed in the Xbox community as I am in the, the PlayStation side, so so I don't know it as well, but one of the, the things that I find in the the playstation community side is that most events and and uh, i don't mean to be biased or bigoted in any way most of the competition seems seems to be very strongly you know uh, populated if you like by male gamers now i know there are some female gamers is it much the same in these xbox events on true achievements do you find or yeah um actually currently on xbox achievements so there's not really there's only like maybe one other active female member it's kind of a um it's not as popular of a site as true achievements anymore so there's not a lot of like mm. um members in total but yeah I've, I've noticed that you know gaming there's a lot of hobbies that i do like gaming that are mostly like mm. male dominant so um that kind of i will i will agree that that's kind of pushed me on in the past as a competitive person to be like, well, I can beat all these boys. Yeah, look, look, I totally agree. I mean, most of the, again, you know, coming from the PlayStation side, but most of the the, the most competitive gamers I know are females, actually. So I don't think there's any, you know. <laughs> I mean, there's obviously, is it a, is no, no bias on the consoles or whatever. It, every, it's equal for everybody, I think, which is the wonderful thing about it. But that's interesting. Now, I want to turn to the the more uh, the ugly side. Well, not the ugly side, the more practical side of it. I, I love hearing, you know, and we've already referenced this, that, you know, to, to get these massive scores, you just have to drop a shitload of money. Uh, now, I already know the answer to this, but I'm going to let you say from reading your blog, what what did this month roughly cost you in games to achieve this 132K? Yeah, so I was kind of interested. Like, I used to watch the Gamer Score League from the sidelines and watch these people drop massive amount of money trying to win it. And I was like, how much exactly are they spending? So this year, um, with finances not being so t- tight anymore, 
Um, I was like, okay, well, I'm going to go for the win. And if I do win, I want to see how much it costs. So in the end, um, all of the expenses for March were $835 to uh, win the Game of Score League. Yeah, yeah. Which look, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't think that's that's too bad because I don't think a lot of people understand that a lot of these games, like your Adelica and, and your other spammy sort of titles, they're not that expensive, are they? Really? No, most games that I played were uh, five to ten dollars or under. Yeah. Um, the most expensive game I bought was Dark Souls. Uh, I had to order it off Amazon. It was like twenty-two dollars. Mm. But. Um, I think I also mentioned it in my blog, but I can't remember. There was only like five games that I paid for that were more than like $15. So, or more than $10, actually. There wasn't a whole lot of games I bought that were expensive. So I played 133 games. So if you kind of do the math, it was not a very expensive per game mm. uh, cost. So... Not at all. Now, how, you know, obviously Game Pass is a wonderful feature of the Xbox. Did this factor into your, your gaming choices at all? I mean, it seems it seems perfect for a, for a competitive sort of achievement hunter having so many games available on that subscription service. But, but does it work out that way for you or, or not so much? Yeah, so as far as the tournament's concerned, I bought a month of Game Pass. I think it was $15 to have the live and whatever. And I think I, I think it was eight games I played from the Game Pass. I pretty much picked off all of the quick ones. Hmm. So if you like, if you do the math, it came to like two dollars a game, which is not bad at all. <laughs> and even currently, like every couple of months, I'll re-sign up for Game Pass and play the new games that have come on there that I wanted to play. So that's what I'm kind of doing right now. Like as soon as the tournament's over, I think I'm gonna try out like uh, either the Outer Worlds or Wolfenstein Youngblood. They're both on Game Pass and pretty not too difficult of a completion. Um, I I love Game Pass. I think it's one of the greatest things Xbox has going for them. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Now, look, tolerate me on this next question because when I was doing some reading about you, particularly in your blog in 2014, and then I wasn't I wasn't quite as convinced in the last two years. But then you haven't written as much, so I, I wasn't not convinced either. But I want to ask you this: Do you do you see gaming as a bit of a job? Um, sometimes, yeah, more, more so because of the completionist nature. Like sometimes I'll play a game that I was like, really like, you know, that was whatever. I don't really, would never play it again. And then I'm like, okay, now I've got all these trophies or achievements I have to clean up. Now I have to play the whole game again on hard or something like that. So in that case, yeah, um, kind of, kind of sucks. And you're like, I really wish this was over. Either that or I could get rid of my completionist nature and just throw it away after I'm done with one playthrough. But um, most of the time, I try to pick games that I think I would enjoy a lot. Or either that or they're free. I'll, I'll give them a shot if they're free, it's like through uh, PlayStation Plus or uh, Games with Gold on Xbox. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Now, the other thing I want to ask you about is, you know, a lot of uh, trophy and achievement hunters, they love statistics. They love numbers. I think they love that more than anything else sometimes, Eris. Do, you know, you, you seem to be very well documented and stuff like this in, in your numbers and your stuff. Putting together these 133 games like you did for this competition, that doesn't happen in like five minutes. You know, there's some research and work goes into that. Do you enjoy that side of it as well, finding these sort of games, reading about them, putting them, you know, know in a list getting them all ready to go because it is a lot of work i think i think that's fair to say isn't it oh yeah absolutely um that's kind of what i had to do like for the gamer score league like you said i had to put together a list i think my list was about 200 games long and they're easy to find because you can search on a on the true achievement website you can search by easiest game by ratio so like mm. games that are closer to 1.0 are extremely easy while a game with like 4.0 or 5.0 is like super hard so mm. i just kind of searched by you know by a descending order to find um the easiest 1.0 games and put them all on a list i like and i included like price and time mm. time to complete and stuff like that so that's how i came up with the list and i just kind of kept picking them off either when they were on sale or what i felt like playing <laughs> Stuff like that. I like that. Now, do, do you have enough left on your list? Do you think for for you for, for a future attempt at this again, or was this a one time thing and and you won't you won't try for a win again? The one hundred thirty two k definitely not. Obviously, as you've probably seen, the likes of Redalica they release weekly. So, like, if you give it a whole year, there's like fifty mm -hmm. new games I could try out next time. But um, 
I haven't really decided. Mm. Obviously, it's a lot of mental fortitude to win a gamer score league. And if somebody signs up with like, you know, the lesser gamer score you have when you sign up, the better, because more games you have available. So like, it's harder to win for someone like me versus someone with half my gamer score who hasn't played a Rattalika game. So um, I haven't really decided. I kind of, I'm kind of a spur of the moment person. Um, so when uh, the sp- when the spring rolls around next year, I will uh, see where I'm at and consider it. Yeah, I like that. I have one more question on that line. But uh, seeing you open the door on on Rattalika, one of the things that I hear a lot about, you know, from the top hunters. I mean, Hakum has continually bitched about it on this show as well, but but everywhere, <laughs> and many many of them have the fact that the problem with Rattalika and and look, I, you know, as as I said, listeners, Rattalika is a friend and a, you know of the show. I receive codes, so therefore, you know, take it as will. I, I have no problem with that company. But having having said that, I know that a lot of them do because of the number of stacks of games available. Up until recently with the Vita, we were looking at, you know, six to eight stacks. It's now been pared down a little bit as they've as they've dropped Vita support. But one of the wonderful things about Xbox is there's usually only one stack of a game. Now, I know there's exceptions with PC sometimes and region, but by and large, there's only one stack of these shorter games. Do you like that? The fact that you don't have to play the same game maybe six to eight times in a competition yeah, like this? Yeah, I've... I've actually never done that on PlayStation, so I don't know how grueling it is to suffer through the same game. Like, at least four, um, you'd have to do a beta trick to get the other ones, but Mm. at least four times in a row, I don't know if I could do it. Like, some of those games that I played on Xbox that were like Rattalika or Sometimes You, I was just like, soon as the last achievement popping, I'm like uninstalling that right away. (laughs) And there were a lot of games like that, so of course there were more enjoyable ones. Rattalika, uh, I really liked Iron Snout, the one with the uh, yes. the Bruce Lee pig. That was extremely fun. I was not expecting that. And uh, another one, Super Box Land, kind of gave me Chips Challenge vibes. I don't know if you've ever heard of that game, but it's an old yes. PC game. Yeah. And that's kind of what it reminded me of. It was really enjoyable playing the first time. But to go back to your question, like I actually played it again on uh, the PlayStation to kind of set the remake up for my 200th platinum milestone and the second time i played the box land i was like oh my god this needs to end this is terrible <laughs> so i could definitely see more than you know two three stacks of the same game for you know trophy count not something i'd want to do yeah it's a difficult position because it definitely inflates the numbers too i think their, their biggest argument and which i understand is of course that because you can play so many of these stacks you don't in effect need to play other games perhaps longer games as well to, to boost your scores or to keep your score although the irony of course of this heiress is that they were all smashing these japanese vns at massive prices before these companies came about so it's much the same now i think their, their problem is that the market's just open to everyone perhaps but it's it's it is interesting but the amount of time that it sucks up i think i think is interesting now you said obviously as you as you go on it becomes harder to win these things that is very true i i understand that but also you tend to get uh recognition i find in the community if you have one and i imagine something as big as this so uh do you do you frequently get offers now to become partners in competitions or to join teams Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, people were offering to join up with <laughs> for the next year, like right after it ended. <laughs> yeah. So like, I've actually I've gotten multiple offers to team up. Yeah. Um, and I tell them all the same thing. I'm like, look, I'm not even sure if I'm gonna participate. You know, I'm not. I'm I'm a spur of the moment person. Yeah. Like it may become March next year, and I'm like, oh, I don't want to do that again. <laughs> I want to play uh whatever game's coming out that March. That could affect it. So. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Yeah, I like definitely. That. Yeah, I like that. It's it's always interesting to to talk to the the person behind the 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 game attack if you like because you you sort of, you know, you look at their profile and you're like, wow, this is this is pretty intense. This is pretty full on, you know. And then then you realize as you talk like and this is this is what I find with so many people having talked on this show that yes, achievements and trophies and completion they're, they're massively important or whatever else, but but the, at the essence it is it is the fun of the game, isn't it? That just it just keeps us going, I think, which is is wonderful, you know. We, we enjoy it as, as a base. And, you know, as you've said today, you started, you know, back with your, your multiplayer days or whatever else. And, you know, you've, you, you've dallied in the spam as we call it here, but you're, you're playing a bit of, a bit of everything. Now there's one gaming series we didn't really touch on today, which I'd like to ask you about as we sort of wrap out, if that's okay. Sure. 
So I, I read that you've uh, you've uh, played or completed almost uh, well, almost or maybe every NASCAR game I think since two thousand and eight, with I'm assuming the exception of the clone trophy list NASCAR Heat Five, <laughs> which you made a comment on, I believe, as well. What is it, <laughs> what is it about the NASCAR games that you love so much? Um, so I actually grew up. Um, a NASCAR fan. My family always went to the uh, local um, track, which was Richmond in Virginia. So I grew up a NASCAR fan, and uh, I've actually played almost every NASCAR game since 1994, actually. So, oh, wow. uh, Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, they have not been easy completions, let me tell you. Uh, starting mm. with like 2008 and 2009, there was just really rough challenges in that game. Then going all the way to like NASCAR Heat 1, which I believe was 2016, that was really difficult without a racing wheel, which I've never really gotten into. So, mm. um, yeah, you're correct. Um, there's only two NASCAR games I haven't completed. Um, obviously, the new one that just came out, which I'm not sure if I'm getting. I'm kind of sick. I'm kind of sick of them for uh, glitch, glitch reasons. Yes. Uh, last year, there was a ton of glitches in them, and they're not increasing in quality. They're just releasing the same game every year. But uh, I actually did not complete NASCAR 15 because I bought it on PC. So I was thinking about going and playing it before the service shut down, just to say I've done it. But at the same time, like, uh, kind of ready to move on from the seventh gen as much as I can. So. <laughs> yeah. No. Look, I I understand. It's funny. It's funny when I read that because you know I wouldn't I wouldn't have assumed you played those games. Obviously, just glancing at your profile and then and when I read that comment and of course. I, I look. I love NASCAR, but not being American, I don't really understand the finer mechanics of it at all. I just like turning left, you know, and crashing and stuff like this. So, so it's <laughs> wonderful. But, but uh, when I picked up the first NASCAR heat game, I had a wonderful time. But I had, uh, I do have a racing wheel, but I had huge trouble getting the speed ratings for some of the tracks, and it didn't occur to me. And I play a lot of racing games, but I just assume, you know, NASCAR's a bit of a stock standard; it'll be fine. You know, the car on the track. But there was so much uh, of actually tweaking the car yourself. You had to do. To Eek, those those couple of points I found at the end, and I don't I don't know maybe maybe growing up with it you you knew all about that it was easy for you but one of the things that I love in the last couple is that they've abandoned that requirement now that speed rating I think it was ninety or ninety five yeah that's the uh, that's the trophy I was telling you about earlier mm. that like I could not get and after probably like three thousand laps at Atlanta I finally got it. <laughs> And yeah, I do. I do know a little bit about the car setups, but I mostly just use like a YouTube uh, how-to. Oh yes. And the problem was the YouTube how-tos are for a racing wheel, mm. so they can run like really loose, which gives you speed in NASCAR. And if you try to do that a controller, you're gonna spin out and wreck. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> I finally hit that Atlanta lap on a controller. It was like. <laughs> It was like, I don't know, it was like really euphoric. <laughs> I, can, I can imagine. Because, of course, that, that immediately popped the uh, platinum, which I had been missing for over a year and a half. So, <laughs> Yeah, that, w- that would be almost enough, I imagine, to turn you off those sort of games completely. But, yeah, I, I, like, yeah, it. I like it. When they, yeah, when they removed the speed trophies in NASCAR E2, I was like, okay, I'm going to get this one. I got nothing to worry about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. they, they are a funny game because, as you say, they're, they're a generic port, basically, of the game the previous year at the point. But one of the things that I like, again, not, you know, just, just watching it occasionally on TV here, you know, god-awful hours in the morning, uh, is is the, they put these challenges in as well now. And I think they've been in for the last couple. These aren't the speed rating challenges. These are the actual real-life events, if you like, that you replicate. And I think, I think again, you know, for someone that has a passing interest in the series or whatever, they're, they're fantastic as well so i'm by no means you know selling this game is amazing it does it does for its price i think it's really <laughs> it's, it's really asking you know for a little bit but having said that those sort of challenges are awesome and if you if you do have a racing wheel this is a force feedback wheel that's decent this is one of the the few games that i think really utilizes it. i mean i can really feel the the grooves on the track with the car through the wheel and the, the force feedback can be really really strong on that wheel so i think they've done a good job there but i agree with you the, the campaign and everything else is is stock standard from from year to year yep 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 yeah agree yeah yeah well, that's perfect I, de- I definitely wanted to touch on that while we had you here today so look it's it's been wonderful to talk to you and to get an insight into to xbox gaming as well because we we hear so little about it unfortunately on this show we'll have to i'll have to dig a bit deeper but but if people wanted to sort of you know follow on or i suppose you know see your progress and stuff what's the best way to do that if you're if you're willing for that 
Yeah, I've never really been like one for social media. Um, I don't have like a, hmm. I only have a Twitter to browse kind of thing. So um, you can look at my PSN profiles and true achievements and just kind of that lets you see what I'm playing. And obviously the blog on Xbox achievements is kind of more for me. I just kind of post all of my games I played hmm. and kind of like a little uh, review of sorts. So those are that's where you can kind of find me. Um, I'm very active on Xbox achievements because I'm staffed there. So I'm usually around. Obviously, that won't help you if you're a PlayStation person, but <laughs> I'm also on the sister site, uh, PlayStationTrophies.org, yeah. hanging around. So just yeah. those trophy and achievement hunting websites. Perfect. And I'll put I'll put some of that in the, the show notes as well. And I would recommend if you've got, you know, a spare five or you know, a couple of hours, perhaps for the listeners, to check out the blog because yeah, I think I think you're very modest. Yes, there, there's some, you know, general thoughts for yourself, but there's also some very in-depth numbers and and particularly on the, the recent gamer score league, uh, insights into what you were thinking and how you went about it, which is is fascinating because we don't we don't often get to hear about this sort of stuff, even though that it's going on all the time. So once again, I want to thank you so much for your time to, to this evening and for joining me and it was it was truly a, a pleasure so thank you Eris. yeah you're welcome i had fun So there you go, listeners. I hope you enjoyed that interesting conversation where we touch a little on the Xbox. And again, thank you to Eris Flower Girl. It was was wonderful, wonderful to hear from the other side as well. Look, we can game on all systems equally and have fun. But perhaps you already do that. Perhaps you already know that. Now, why don't we turn to the Push to Plat Platinum Club shout-outs. Remember, if you want a shout-out, you can drop your Platinum picture in the free-to-join PSN community on the PS4 or in the Discord, which is in the show notes in the show thread. And we'll give you a shout-out for your hard work. So why don't we start today with Eigen Space, number 121, Donut County. And I believe she enjoyed this game very, very much. Look, it's what, what's not to enjoy? It's fantastic, fantastic. JB Trophy Hunter, 1975. Trophy 5000. It's a milestone, sir. Congratulations. Trophy 5000. And finally got his platinum in Resident Evil Code Veronica X. Well, look, that's like, I believe that's like old school uh, Resident Evil, I think. So congratulations, sir. That is probably too difficult for me, but I, I tip my digital hat for your milestone as well. Gaz Davis 11. Oh, look, this is more in my line of games. Number 69, how appropriate. Super Destronaut DX on the Vita. Now, Gaz here, he's, he's gone on to say, there was a stage I was thinking, I didn't remember it being this tough on the PS4. I knew that you had to only play to level 12 on challenges, but I missed the trophy pop, so wasn't sure what I was on. Quit out on level 19. <laughs> That's a lot of extra work, Gaz. Uh, I was having to kill 100 enemies in 40 seconds. Of course, Gaz is not used to playing these short, short, nasty sort of games so you know he, he was probably shocked that even after level 19 you got a plat but you know gaz you that you, you basically played half the game again you know <laughs> level 12 that's it that's it with these games uh onyx uh massive milestone here for onyx number 800 ghosts of toshima and look my my respect grows for you sir because i know how long that game is now it's monotonous at times the cleaning up that map it's just continuous but congratulations and he's gone on here to say honestly i think it is the best way to end this gen with an exclusive that really showed the possibilities of the PS4. And look, the more I play, the more I would have to agree with you. I know it was a little harsh a week or two ago when it first came out, but but I do I do agree with you. And it, 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 if you love Assassins, it's going to scratch, scratch that itch. It definitely is. Uh, Renichi, number 159, The Chronicles of Riddick, Assault on Dark Athena. Again, I apologize, sir. I know nothing of this game other than I'm sure it's a highly skilled game. Congratulations. Mr. Tam, number 86, Rhyme. Now, this is a beautiful game, but I've heard, I've always heard mixed things about it. So let's see what he, let's see what he feels, listeners. This was a fun game. Nice little puzzler. Great art style. I had to look up the last couple of collectibles because I missed them entirely. And his platinum shot here, it's just a beautiful, relaxing shot of the beach and water. It's just its just lovely. So, look, I don't know. Maybe I know that game was PS Plus at one stage. I know it's always on sale. I believe I even have a physical copy of that game from ages ago. So, maybe one day, one day. Redbeard Rick. Now, it's not often that I get stumped with a game that I've never heard of, but he has done it here today. Listeners, number 185, Demon's Tier Plus, the Vita Stack. 
great fun twin stick shooter roguelike cross by with two lists. So I, I knew nothing about this game other than you know Rick has recently played it, so automatically it, it, it's of quality. I can I can assure you, listeners. But I looked up a guide. It's around five to ten hours. I, I'm not sure the difficulty on it, but it, it sort of it seems progressive. So I think if you die, you, you go back to the beginning. I, w- I wasn't sure if you you lose everything like your money and your points because it seems to work in sort of three tiers if you like or three worlds but but you know if, if that isn't the case if it's a progressive thing then I, I might be quite interested in that but it may be something to, to check out a uh, new new member for the group here dash vip dash which you know i love the name so you are you are a vip that is for sure number 765 now i believe it's lego ninjago i don't think it's shadows of rodents i think it was lego ninjago there uh, congratulations sir EDJ3DG, number 48, Hitman Absolution HD. Well, that's a throwback, isn't it, that game? But congratulations, sir. Another another big game and a big plat. It's good to see you're, you're moving nicely through your backlog there. And to wrap us out today, we have Ed the Shed, number 117 and 118, Josiah the First Case HD. That's the EU and NA stack. Congratulations, sir. Quite an easy skippable VN as well. Not suggesting you did that, but you know, if you if you were inclined to, or around the 15 to 20 minute mark. And then number 119 and 120, Nicole, EU and NA. So this, this is an interesting one as well. Again, skippable in like 15 minutes, I think, or something. But interesting VN where you can play in two elements. You can play in VN mode or you can play in uh, this sort of stat building mode if you like where you actually choose what you do throughout the day. I know that this uh, game is priced substantially higher on the store for Radalika Port. So it, it, that is that is partly the reason. Yes, it can be a quick plat, but if you're going to engage in both systems, it's, it's a full VN of around 15 uh, 15 hours. If you are going to uh, uh, you know, uh, use that method, I believe Noff's guides have a, a full walkthrough. Or if you're looking for a more skip walkthrough, I believe they are available i think uh i think dino raw and dex may have been uh, involved in that dex guides as well so there's there's something there for everybody so listeners that brings us to the end of another week i hope you continue to smash the cap i hope the trophies fly every which way and land on your that's right your your own profile until next week have fun happy gaming i'll speak to you soon Push to Plat podcast are conceived, written, and edited by CJ Anderson in Adobe Audition. YouTube upload handled by Repurpose.io. Music licensing by Artist.io. Push to Plat would like to thank our Patreon producers Zador VP, Redbeard Rick, T Bird, Olsero, and Ready to Ebeg. Without your support, this show would cease to exist. If you would like to say hi, jump into the Discord in the show notes or on Twitter at push to plat If you're interested in supporting the show, then jump on Patreon, the push to plat Patreon, where you can find more information on how to support us and allow us to continue to bring wonderful guests and topics from around the world. Yeah.